you know, you really don't need a forensics team to get to the bottom of this. If you guys were the inventors of Facebook, you'd have invented Facebook. <laughs> Hello and welcome once again to The Cinephiles, where each week we enter the world of a great film. We explore the themes, the history, the filmmaking, and the influence it has on us today. My name is Steve Morris, and I am a filmmaker and directing instructor in Los Angeles, California. Hello, everyone. My name is John Roke. I'm a writer, producer, and host uh, in San Diego, California, and very much excited to be jumping uh, back into the world of the social network, the Citizen Kane of uh, the tw- uh, last 23 years, in my mm-hmm. opinion. And I'm very much excited to welcome back to the Cinephiles microphone my partner on Enterprise Incidents and one of our favorite, favorite, favorite guests, the great Scott Mance. Welcome back. Uh, thank you, fellas. And I'm Scott Mance, and I am a big, big, huge, massive champion of the Cinephiles, the very best show to get into deep dives of the greatest movies of all time, the best conversation you will ever hear about these classic movies anywhere in the universe wow thank you so much your your support of the show has just meant the world and the and i it is very very much appreciated and i'll say an interesting thing the fact that these conversations have grown longer and longer (laughs) often (laughs) often like being multiple like when we first did it it was sort of well we just recorded a three-hour conversation and then i cut it into two and now it's like well we talk for a while and then we go that's enough and let's take a break and the thing that (laughs) the thing that happens though is that it's been like a week since our last conversation. Yeah. And that's given me time to think about this and reviewing my notes and new things occur because of the time cool. over which we're having this these talks. And here's the thing that occurred to me that I just wanted to share with you while we before we get going. Mm. Having watched a ton of Aaron Sorkin projects, you know, everything from A Few Good Men and The American President and of course The West Wing News, all those shows, the characters are incredibly likable. Even people who are antagonists, like Colonel Jessup, the Jack Nicholson character, even though he's the bad guy, essentially, of A Few Good Men, he's an admirable bad guy. Do you know what I mean? Like, you're, he's charismatic. You're drawn to him. On the West Wing, when they would bring in, obviously, the show has a liberal bias. When they would bring in a conservative like Ainsley Hayes or some of the other characters, they were always super interesting. And you could feel Sorkin's love for them and their mm-hmm. charisma and the joy. I think the social network has the most unlikable cast of characters of anything Sorkin has ever done. The only two people for Uh, me that I like are Erica and Eduardo, you know, like everyone else I dislike in this movie. Wow. That's a really good point. That's a a really good point. I don't agree, but it's a strong statement. I respect it. Why don't you agree, uh, Johnny? Yeah. Oh, because I think there are a lot of, well, the thing is, I, I under the construct that you've laid out, likable is different for me than interesting, obviously. Oh, so totally. Me, oh, 100%. Yeah. yeah. I think what he does is make interesting characters. And it's up to us subjectively if we like them or not. But I find everyone fascinating in this movie. Utterly fascinating. Endlessly totally. fascinating. Every time I watch it, uh, even Mazzello, who doesn't get that a lot of time, the moments he, is that he has, he's very yeah. likable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like... Just the things that they go through in this, it's a real exposure of how our culture was changing. And it's so brilliant to see that uh, Fincher didn't pull any punches and Sorkin didn't pull any punches in the script at showing you this stuff. And you had to keep up and catch up and accept that this world was changing right out from under you as you were watching the movie. So these characters have so much dimension to them that I find them endlessly fascinating. You know, the character of Erica... To say that she's likable is definitely a fair statement. Mm, sure. But there's not there's not a whole lot to the character other than right. to serve as a as a motive, as an MO yeah. for you could argue for Zuckerberg to like really create Facebook in the first place. Yeah. But it's Saverin who, yes, he's definitely likable, but at the same time, you just want him to really have more chutzpah. You know what I mean? Yes. He yes. doesn't have the foresight to know that he's going to have the rug pulled down from under him until it's too late. And, you know, I've been thinking, Steve, what, about what you were saying before about, about actually what both you guys were saying before about the relationship between Zuckerberg and Saverin. And I mentioned, I had this epiphany during the last conversation about why is Saverin even friends with Zuckerberg? 
Mm-hmm. And then, you know, the three of us agree, well, you know, we all have friends who are not like, you know, perfect and, you know, we they're friends anyway, whatever. But they're like best friends. You know, I have some friends, I've had some friends over the years who, you know, were like idiots or, you know, real pains in the asses, but they had you know, some good qualities. And I'm like, well, you know, they're, they're good for this. And ultimately they're, they're, they're good to me or whatever. Wait, in Philadelphia, you had friends like this in Philly, in Philly. (laughs) What a shock. In in, in Philly. Yes. I just love the expression. I have a friend. They're good for this. (laughs) That's such a true (laughs) statement about certain friends. It's like, uh, for this. <laughs> no, I mean, actually, uh, John, I'm glad you pointed it out because I yeah. absolutely mean Philly, like like yeah. in high school and in college who, who like, but now like with looking back on some of those friendships, I'm like, why was I friends with them? Yeah, sure. Like, you know, they were like my roommate from my junior year of college. His name was Eric Litt. And I don't give a flying fuck if he is listening to this podcast. Oh, wow. Here we go. He was a grade A asshole. And I saw him wow. about 10 years ago, like I was in Philly for, for some reason. And I, I saw him and, you know, like, you know, bygones are bygones. And Bye, I went, right. Hey, how you doing? Good to see you. And he like, the attitude he gave to me, was like, no time had passed. And I was just like, oh my God, you know, like again, thinking like, why was I friends with him? And, and, yeah. and just Saverin and Zuckerberg are so so different. Their personalities are so different. And it's so obvious that Zuckerberg was jealous of Saverin when he was like getting into the fraternity that he was getting into. And but that that Saverin didn't like see that Zuckerberg was jealous. And and he just he just was like not he was he's obviously a very smart guy, but he was so naive. And he just by the time he realized it, it was just way too late. Yeah. And I want to add something to it. Well, not add, but I want to take your point a little bit. You said, like, I have friends who are good for this. For Zuckerberg, Eduardo was good for this. He was good totally. to get him started. He was good to get the seed money. Once it became big, he was no longer good for Zuckerberg and where he wanted to go because you said his vision wasn't big enough. And I think when I watched the movie the first time years ago, I felt sympathy for him. I don't feel as much sympathy now when I watch it. I mean, when Parker, who is who is probably, Steve, to your point, 100% the most unlikable guy in this movie, when he calls him out for the shucking and jiving he's doing for these low-rent ads and low-rent sponsors, he is, he is correct to call out Eduardo on this. And Eduardo, because he's small potatoes, he doesn't have the connections, he doesn't have these kinds of things, this is where he gets caught in the grind of it all. But when he gets fucked over and he has that scene we're going to get to, or maybe in the fourth part of this, <laughs> where he has the back and forth with him and says, you know, uh, calls him out for fucking him over, smashes the computer and says, I'm not coming for 30%. I'm coming for all of it. That's the moment you've been waiting for in the movie. And it's the, when you see it, it's such an awesome moment for Eduardo. Uh, and for us as the, as the uh, viewer, because we get to see, as Scott said, him have some chutzpah in that moment. So first, so there's so much to talk about there, and we'll get to it in part seven. <laughs> but but yeah. just, just wait till I give you some of the info on what actually happened, and compare and how oh. see how that changes how you might feel about Eduardo. But one thing I I and I know, listen, I I know it's become a, a running joke. I we we both just made the joke of how long these things are being. I know we haven't even gotten back into the film, but you made me think of another question, which is we're told they're best friends. Do you ever yeah. feel? a sense of deep friendship between these guys while watching the film? I think from Eduardo's point of view, I do. There's a real care for Mark. There's, he's trying to keep yeah. Mark from doing bad things. You know, he's like, don't do this stuff. Don't do this. So from Eduardo, because I think Eduardo is more emotionally mature than Mark is. So Eduardo is a guy who legitimately has a, a, a care for Mark, uh, for Mark. Mark, maybe not so much. Mark sees Eduardo as maybe the last like the what can I go, the lighthouse amidst the storm of his own insecurities, his own shit. Mm. It is Eduardo who is the light uh, house that can get him back to normal or get him to peace. But it is Eduardo who is constantly trying to be f- the best friend to Mark. And even when they're you know when they're getting the girls, those, those two guys that are making out with those women in the bathroom, it's those two dudes. And that moment they have outside the bathroom, the smirk they share with each other, and then the guy coming up and he's like, all right, cool, man. I mean, that's the, probably the last moment of actual friendship that those two actually share. But yeah. That's, that's such a great point. And that's a great question, Steve. 
I, I would yeah. say that the moments where I really felt like there was there were the seeds of a friendship there were were fleeting. Uh, in addition to the moment that John's talking about, you know, there is that moment when when Savern walks into the room and the the two guys are sort of battling each other out on their computers and, you know, everybody's drinking and cheering them on and cheering them on and cheering them on. And then like the one guy wins and Zuckerberg goes, congrats, welcome to Facebook. And he looks back at Saverin and smiles and Saverin looks at him and smiles. Mm. And like, there's this, like, there's definitely an understanding there. There's definitely a, like the, a, a moment where, where they're looking at each other going like, look what we did. Mm. Look what we did. But then at the same time, while the first time I saw the film, the first couple times I saw the film, I felt sorry for Saverin watching yeah. the movie again to prep for this massive epic episode of the cinephiles. <laughs> I felt like Saverin should have known better. You should have yeah. seen the writing on the wall and taken action sooner. Uh, it, it's so interesting. And again, it goes back, Scott, to your original comparison in Citizen Kane, which is that mm -hmm. there is no question in my mind when we meet Jed and Charlie, when they walk into the offices of the examiner, mm -hmm. they are friends. Mm -hmm. Like, this is someone who gets Charlie, who understands him, and Charlie likes that, and they joke together and all this stuff. I I totally agree, John, with what you said. I see Eduardo trying to be a really good friend to Mark. Yes. Yeah. I don't see Mark ever trying to be a good friend to Eduardo. And I don't see moments of like connection. Like these guys are mm -hmm. finishing each other's sentences or really understanding. I don't see that at all. Yeah. And I think you, you know? make a good comparison with the citizen Kane stuff because Charlie gives to, uh, to Leland, he gives friendship. He gives back yeah. and forth. He gives this kind of stuff. Mark doesn't have that. And that's the thing. Mark is consistently who Mark is from the beginning totally. of the movie to the end. There is no arc, in my opinion, or if there is, it's a real slight arc by the time Rashida Jones gives him that back and forth at the end of the movie. Mark is who he is consistently. And you see these little microaggressions from Mark when he oh, yeah. when he takes money out or borrows money from Eduardo. And it, like that scene we're going to get to when Eduardo says, he tells him, like, I need extra blah, blah, blah. And Eduardo says, okay, I'll get it for you. He's like, don't worry, I already took it out. So like he takes these liberties with Eduardo that a friend shouldn't take, but that's how Mark sees it as more of a transactional friendship than totally. an actual friendship because he's not capable of it, at least as the character is constructed in the movie. Yeah. You, you know, when I when I made my initial connection between Social Network and Citizen mm -hmm. Kane and just over these last, you know, 13 years now, almost 13 years, you know, I've become so steeped in my convictions that literally, like you said at the top of the show, Johnny, like this is the Citizen Kane of the last 23 mm -hmm. years of the 21st century. Yeah. But Steve pointing out that moment when they walk into the newspaper, like you see just how much Jedediah Leland admires, yeah. he admires Kane. He will do anything for Kane. He will follow Kane into an active volcano. And then when it cuts ahead, you know, the decade later, after they basically, um, you know, recruited all the journalists from the Inquirer, and there's that big, you know, uh, song and dance for Charlie, Charlie Kane. And, you know, you see Leland like moving on and he's talking to the other guys like saying, you know, will will success change him? Mm -hmm. So there's more of a tragic arc, obviously, as we know, with Kane than there is with Zuckerberg. But in the case of Zuckerberg and, and uh, Saverin, it's just it still hurts. It still yeah. hurts to see the stares back and forth uh, during the deposition scenes yeah. when they're just staring at each other. And like the betrayal, like you just, you really freaking feel it under your skin and it's tragic, man. I mean, how much of that is true? I'm sure Steve, you'll tell us. Um, mm -hmm. But as a film from a cinematic experience, this movie just has aged so well. Yeah. Um, well, speaking of the depositions, that's exactly where we're going to go next. And, and by the way, the, the, we don't know. These depositions are sealed. So this is Aaron Sorkin's version of what he speculates might have happened. Many of the facts around the case are established, but exactly what Mark Zuckerberg said, he didn't talk the way Aaron Sorkin wants him to talk. But this is the other interesting thing, is that it was seen that there was these two depositions. This is what gave Aaron Sorkin the understanding of how to structure the film. 
And what he said, what drew him to the film, and this, I think, is a totally another Citizen Kane connection, is that there are really three entirely parallel stories. There are three versions of what happened. There's Eduardo's versions, there's the Winklevi version, and there's the Mark Zuckerberg version. And that, and this is the thing, too, is Citizen Kane is a totally revolutionary structure of a film. It is a, we're going to go and see the story of this guy's life through multiple different perspectives, and we're going to go back and forth in time to do that. This does not follow the Citizen Kane structure, but it is a totally revolutionary way to structure a film. I mean, normally, like, there's lots of movies where there's a trial and there's flashbacks. That's not what this is. The intercutting of even within a sentence between deposition and... And then going to the real thing and then back to deposition and back and forth and going not just to one deposition, but two of them and hearing different people piece together the story simultaneously. That doesn't exist in any other movie ever, as far as I'm concerned. That's a really great point. And also worth pointing out that during those deposition scenes, the level of arrogance displayed by Zuckerberg are really just, talk about chutzpah. (laughs) I mean, Jesus Christ. I mean, you know, some of Zuckerberg's best lines and worst moments, because they kind of go hand in hand in his character, are during those deposition scenes, as we'll we'll see. And and one other thing I'll say is that I will say the perspective I understand the least or believe the least is Mark Zuckerberg's perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm. I believe that Eduardo and the Winklevi are telling the truth from their perspective. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the truth is from Mark's perspective. Kind of like you don't know the truth of Kane's perspective. Yeah, exactly. Oh my God. What a great point. Like I believe, I believe Saverin's truth. And that's the key here. This is his truth. I believe the Winklevi's truth, their truth. I don't believe Zuckerberg. Nope. I mean, I don't believe him at all. And I never thought about that before. This is what you get when you do the cinephiles. <laughs> so, and, and, and I want to talk about also, these are huge set pieces. These two, like we see them as kind of one line at a time or one moment at a time, but they were shot like a play. So they were shot all at once. And a whole bunch of stuff about this. The first thing is we have two depositions. One's the West Coast deposition. That's Eduardo's. The environment is totally informal in a West Coasty kind of way. The other one is the East Coast with the Winklevi, and it is totally, totally formal in the East Coast old money way. So that's the first thing, you know, the wood paneling, all you know, that kind of stuff. The second thing is they shot this as like a, you know, 20-page play or something, Uh which Uh meant that all the actors had to be there all the time. And they rehearsed, and and again, I'm going to explain this thing. I know I've talked about it before, but... Uh, there's this idea of the line and crossing the line and, and, or it's also called the 180 degree rule. And what it basically is, is you want to make sure that it looks like characters who are looking at each other in a scene are actually looking at each other. And the thing is, is that if we have a shot and I've got a two shot of, of John and Scott, and I have the camera on John's, uh, over John's left shoulder, the camera has to be over Scott's right shoulder. And that way it appears like they're looking at each other. Mm -hmm. If I put the camera over John's left shoulder and Scott's left shoulder, it'll look like they're facing away from each other. So which side, and if I have three people, now I have three different lines. And if I put the camera at one place and someone turns their head to the other person, it's not going to look right. Which is why if you look at like dinner table scenes frequently, for some strange reason, everybody's sitting on the same side of the table because it's easier to film that way and not cross the line. We have like 10 different people in each of these scenes. Mm -hmm. Fincher always has two cameras going at once. And rather than just putting them on one side of the table or fixing like one line, he decides to shoot them from every possible camera position for like 20 different lines. So that if anyone turns to the right, you could always have a camera that catches them from the right perspective. So not only do you have like 99 takes, but you have 99 different camera setups in these rooms as they're doing the scene over and over and over again. I mean, that they spent so much time, but the advantage of it, like in a play, the actors are discovering all sorts of things and business and handy stuff constantly as they're working on these scenes. Amazing. So you were called in front of the ad board. That's not what happened. You weren't called in front of the administrative board. No, back. I mean, that's back at the bar with Erica Albright. She said all that? Mark. That I said that stuff to her. We actually are coming in late to the scene. And what we find out here is that, oh, Erica Albright also did a deposition in which she told this these lawyers, for the record, what happened in that opening date scene where they broke up. 
How do you think that makes us feel as an audience? And how does that make us feel for Mark in the situation? Great question. Uh, I, I don't think it makes me sympathize with Mark at all. He's already lost. I, I, I mean, there's nothing about, there's only one scene where I actually felt sympathy for Mark. Mm. And that's later, and I'll get to it. Uh, but it's something that we've already touched upon, just kind of like looking ahead. As for how that makes me feel about Erica Albright, I mean, I absolutely sympathize with her. Like everyone else who crossed his path, you know, was he treated her very poorly. I'll just say what's really interesting to me, it's this weird magic trick of making us understand that all of this, this entire story is happening in these depositions. Because the whole thing that we already saw, we hear has actually been described in this room to the lawyers. One person we noticed, and it's so funny because I hadn't watched the movie in a while and I had forgotten about her. And I had not watched Parks and Recreation when Mm. I first saw the movie. And I now have watched Parks and Recreation because they're sitting there is Rashida Jones, which, by the way, my Mac uh, autocorrects Rashida into Rawhide. And I think the name Rawhide Jones (laughs) is a pretty cool name. I like that. (laughs) So here's the thing. So you heard me just describe what shooting these scenes was like. She essentially was an extra. Because she doesn't have any lines in all of these deposition scenes. Mm. She had to sit there. A, a known name star had to sit day after day after day, hour after hour, essentially as an extra in this scene. And she just was like, I'll do anything to work with Aaron Sorkin and David Fincher. She was happy to be there. But that's a huge commitment from her. It's a it's a huge commitment. But of course, I mean, her 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 presence during the coda of the film. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Make, makes it feel like her actions and motivations and presence and uh, place in the entire film is is much more prevalent than it actually is. Yeah, they knew what they were doing because to have that code, as you said, Scott, they you we had to see her in the room. Exactly. She didn't have to speak, but we had to see her. The site got twenty two hundred hits within two hours. Thousand. What? Twenty two thousand. Wow. And then we cut to crew practice and we are going to meet the Winklevi. So first thing, Fincher wanted this all shot at golden hour and golden hour. We've talked about many times is those few moments at sunrise or sunset. There's maybe 15 minutes. So what they did was every single morning for like a month, these guys got up to film one piece of this sequence at golden hour. What? Because that's, because you, you only have 15 minutes to shoot. So it's like, go out there, get on the water, get the boats on the water, get warmed up. The sun is coming up. Get the shot. Okay, we're done. See you tomorrow. Let me ask you guys a question. When you saw this movie, raise your hand or at least let me know because, you know, this is audio. <laughs> if you thought these Winklevi were actually two different actors. Yes. I had never heard of Army Hammer, had never seen him in anything. And so when I saw this movie, I'm like, these are twins. Yep. When I found out later that they that it was one actor doing both roles, and I know he's persona non grata now, but I was amazed, A, at the technology, how much, because I mean, you know, we all grew up at that time in the 70s where you would watch those twin things, and you're sure. like, yeah, this is pretty, you know, see-through. <laughs> the enemy within. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or even the Incredible <laughs> Hulk or anything. Like, whenever they try to do the twins thing, you'd be like, Ugh. but this was so seamless and believable. Even watching it in 2023, I marveled at how believable it is that these are two completely different people with two completely different personalities as twins. And so, yeah, I absolutely thought they were two twins. Okay. So I didn't see it in the theater. So by the time I saw Uh, it at home, I had heard that. So I did know it going into it. I would never have suspected it. Here is what I didn't know. And I am so blown away by this. I didn't understand what had actually happened or how this was accomplished. Oh, yeah. And Josh Pence who is the actor who is the other twin, who is essentially the stand-in that Army Hammer's face gets put on, he is the fucking unsung hero of this movie. (laughs) He is so amazing what he did. And I have to explain what happened. So first of all, the first thing they do is they go, we need to go out and look for two six-foot-five, 220-pound identical twins who could row crew. (laughs) (laughs) So they really struggled to find that. Yeah. And then they said, well, 
and then the, the two, and then they go, okay, well, maybe we'll have them be fraternal twins. So they don't have to be exactly identical and we'll cast two actors. And the two actors they narrow it down to are Army Hammer and this guy, Josh Pence. And they auditioned them and auditioned them and auditioned them. Both of them had learned essentially 25 pages of dialogue to be able to have this part. And they're going back and forth and back and forth. And finally, and at the same time, people, and I can totally see how this happens, people come into Fincher and go, and, hey, we could maybe do this digitally. This is right, you know, we did uh, Captain America for uh, Marvel, and that's where they stuck. You know, they made Skinny Steve, and they had all these techniques for doing that. And they were like, we're at the technology where maybe we could have it be just one actor. And they decide that they like Army slightly more than Josh. So then Fincher calls up Josh and says, essentially, look, you're awesome. We would like to have you on the movie. How would you feel if you acted the part and then we cut off your head and stuck Army's face on your face? <laughs> what was his response to that? He says that he threw the phone through a wall and <laughs> threw up and then agreed to do it. Oh, my God. What and, a slap in the face. But, you know, what are you going to do? Say no to David Fincher? <laughs> but, but here's what I didn't understand. I The way it was in my brain was, oh, there was a body double. And then they, you know, and he walked through the part and then they stuck in digitally Army's face. That is not what happened at all. Wow. You know that huge, long shoot I just described where they had multiple cameras on everybody? Yeah. Josh Pence went through the entire rehearsal process. He shot every single shot acting, not just one part, but both parts. Because he is, when Army is playing Tyler, he's playing Cameron. And when Army is playing Cameron, he's playing Tyler. And what they had to do was, Josh was treated as an actor on the set. He wasn't right. treated as a stand-in. He's acting the part, and then the script supervisor is studying everything that he does, and then Army is, imp is imitating Josh. So he has to imitate Josh's performance, his physicality, everything that he does. So Josh is on this whole movie from beginning to end playing not just one part, but both parts as a full fucking actor. Uh, and then his face is taken away. That is crazy. When I, when I saw this for the first time, there was not one doubt, not for one second, did I think that it was one actor playing these two roles. I remember yeah. it was even after the junket because no one, no, you know, when I was at Access Hollywood at the time, no one knew who Army Hammer was, and no one thought to ask Aaron Sorkin or or Fincher, "Hey, how the hell did you do that?" You know, I mean, and when we all found out, I remember when I found out, I just went like, "That was like one of the most mind blowing revelations about the making of a film, the making of a film, not watching a film with a plot yeah. twist." But I just still to this day, when I was rewatching it for this, for Cinephiles, I just went, I was watching it, just shaking my head going, wow, like I'm looking for any kind of something that would show me that, nope, that's a visual effect or whatever, or that's, that's the enemy within split screen or whatever. But no, it's seamless. It is flawless. And John, as you point out, Army mm -hmm. Hammer is, uh, you know, kind of a... Uh, Touchy subject these days, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to put it mildly, but yeah. still the marvel at his performances yeah. and the way that this was all infused. In addition to what you guys pointed out in the previous uh, Cinephiles episode about all the visual effects about mm -hmm. making Harvard look like Harvard just really is a, 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 a landmark in visual effects for a film that that where the, you, you don't even realize you're watching a visual effect. Mm. Exactly. And what they did is, so when Josh is acting the part, he's got little dots on his face and that allows them to do all sorts of 3D tracking. And then they also had to put like army into a rig where they're focused on his face and 3D mapping his face as he says words and vowel sounds so they can get all the lip movement. And they're creating a digital model of everything and then be able to remove Josh's face and stick army's face on. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. um, it's a crazy amount of technology, and, and don't um, feel too bad for Josh Pence. He's been a series regular on a good trouble on the Good Trouble series for like four years now. So you know he's doing okay. He's doing. Yeah, I'm glad. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad to hear it. Huh. Uh, and also, they also had to row. Josh Pence had rowed for Rutgers, I think. So oh, he wow. actually really knew how to do it. Uh, so Army had to catch up, and they had to. Tra and uh, so it's not just again. It's not just a stand-in. Josh had to train for months and months and months in order to be able to row and do all these rowing sequences. And yet his face does not appear in the film. Well, his face does appear once in the film. 
Um, even to the point, and uh, and then we'll, we'll we'll move on. But like when you row, you get blisters on your fingers. Yeah. And so if Josh got blisters on his hands and they put tape on it, they had to tape Army's hands in exactly the same places in order for them to continually match. I mean, it's just so much work went into this. You know who else um, has blisters on his fingers? <laughs> <laughs> Ringo. Ringo. Guys. I got blisters on my fingers. <laughs> um, speaking of which, yesterday I watched because I'm trying to catch up on the movies I missed in the last decade. I watched Whiplash, which I had never seen. Oh, good film. Oh good. man, oh man. You fucking got great it. movie. Are we had ten years on that one. On the cinephile. I think it's probably ten years. That's a great oh, fucking movie. That. Anyway. 2014. Um, so uh Anyway, we see them rowing. They're obviously super fast. We go into a dining hall, and there we meet uh, Divya uh, Narendra, which is uh, Max Mignella. Two nights ago, a sophomore choked the network from the laptop of Kirkland. How he crashed the Harvard computers, how he pissed off a bunch of female undergrads. And they, he says, what were you doing that none of us heard about this? I don't know. Three-hour low-rate technical row before breakfast. Full course load, studying. Another three hours in the tank, and then studying. I'm not sure how we missed it. And it's like you immediately get a sense of who these guys are. Yeah, totally. What's funny to me is that they're obviously hugely accomplished, disciplined, good looking guys. And I don't particularly like them. Uh, I, <laughs> you know? it's, it's the, the privilege that is seeping from their skin is so off putting and their attitude is like, Hey, we've got this idea, you know, for the Harvard connection, let's use this guy Zuckerberg. He's a geek. He's a wimp, you know? Yeah. Uh, they could totally underestimate him. And that is evident from the beginning. And, uh, you know, I think I'm getting ahead of myself here. But when when they make that connection with Zuckerberg, there's conflict from the outset. It's never, oh, hey, good to meet you. They never have any kind of cordial relationship, not at all. And yeah. it's all it's almost like, what were you even thinking getting in bed with this guy uh, when you had such a you know, a tough relationship from the beginning, but again, I'm getting ahead of myself yeah. here. Well, yeah. And I think it's smart in terms of script construct. And look, of course, Aaron Sorkin doesn't need me to stroke his ego, but it is genius to create this character who is not likable in Mark Zuckerberg. Look, he's compared women to farm animals. He embarrasses Erica, talks about her bra size, talks about her changing her name, all these terrible things, right? We get that. And so in order for us to care about this as a, this person as a protagonist, we have to introduce other people who might be seen as kind of worse and maybe even in a subconscious way because, as Scott pointed out here astutely, their privilege, their arrogance, their money, their people hate the rich. Most people hate the rich. And so you see that that seeps through in their aloofness. And even with their friend, they have a bit of an aloofness and the fact that they have to throw their resume at the guy to tell them why they haven't heard about face smash speaks to that kind of thing, you know? Oh. And so in order to make us care about Mark a little bit, we have to see these guys as not guys that we normally want to cheer for. So it lets us play this game of constantly wondering what side of the fence we're on. So it's really smart construction in a film. Well, and I think too, and it's like, you know, all the privilege stuff, that's how I feel about these guys too. I just have yeah. an immediate sort of response to them. But yeah. the thing is, is like, do they in fact do anything wrong? Having an idea and hiring someone who, you know, bringing someone on to be a soft, software person, that's what businesses do everywhere. That is, you know, in Hollywood, it's like you, you know, you got some producer or executive who goes, I have an idea. And they find a screenwriter to write their oh, idea. No. Right. That's, they, this is they tried to use him for to advance themselves in an idea and a project you're absolutely right he just turned the tables on him but, he was but, you, you, yeah. but steve that's a great question is there anything wrong with someone coming up with an idea and then noticing that this guy is actually smart enough to pull it off yeah, yeah, but, yeah. you know that the like i like you pointed out like we're talking about the privilege is so off-putting and you know the Winklevi. Uh, you know, Cameron and Tyler, you know, I, I think I'm overusing that already. The Wink of I, the Wink of Us twins, they're, they're not as smart as Zuckerberg. Sabrin is not as smart as Zuckerberg. Mm -hmm. So in terms of like, you know, being likable and not likable, you know, the Wink of Us twins are not likable because they're just seeping with privilege and arrogance about it. But what ultimately makes Zuckerberg likable is he's really damn smart. You know, he's the smartest mm -hmm. guy in the room. And as much as he's 
the also by far the most arrogant and self-absorbed person in the room. Yeah. There's something about his intelligence that you just go, God, that's, that's, you know, gotta, gotta admire the guy. I, I, yeah. I think audiences gravitate to intelligence. I really oh, sure. think they do. And especially for the audiences that would go see a film like this. Do you know what I'm saying? I think they would gravitate to that. So he kind of gets the edge on the Winkle vibe because you can be born into privilege and wealth. Intelligence is something that is, you can, I don't know how can I say this. It's a natural instinct and it's not given to you in an obvious way like your wealth or your birth or whatever. There's difference here. And so it seems more natural, more organic than say being born into money. You either so have I, it or you don't. Exactly. What's interesting too, and again, I I feel like I'm defending the the, the twins, which isn't exactly my point. That's but okay. it's like, I mean, yeah. but the fact is, are, <laughs> are are the Winklevoss intelligent people? They totally are. Do yeah. they work extremely hard? They totally do. I mean, being an Olympic athlete is no fucking joke. You know yeah. what I mean? The amount of discipline it takes to do that thing. Um, by the way, my my high school, which uh, couldn't win a football game to save their life, had wor- a world class crew program where two guys from my grade went to the Olympics. Wow. Rowing crew, yeah. Did they wow, play six wow. against uh, but, but The thing with the Winklevoss twins is, yeah. is that the, when, they, when they approach Zuckerberg, they are so condescending to him. Yeah. They're so condescending, and they look down on him because he's you know a nerd, he's a geek, as intelligent as he is, and as much as they know that he could pull this off, the fact that way that they treat him, the way that they're so condescending to him, almost like makes it like you're going to get what you deserve here, fellas. So uh, we cut to Zuckerberg at the administration board getting in trouble for the uh, for the you know taking down the Harvard system. Well, the first shot of him is of his sandals as he's tapping his feet, and this was really important to him because Zuckerberg was well known for wearing hoodies, shorts in all weather, and sandals. <laughs> and they wanted to make sure to show this. Um, one funny thing, by the way, from the actual Mark Zuckerberg, who did see this film, he said something like, you know, it's really interesting that they work so hard to get my shoes and and hoodie right, but added whole things that never, ever happened to me in my life. <laughs> I've already apologized in the Crimson to the ABHW, to Fuerza Latina, and to any women at Harvard who may have been insulted as I take it that they were. And then he says, and I think this is a fascinating moment. As for any charges stemming from the breach of security, I believe I deserve some recognition from this board. Uh, I'm sorry? Yes. I don't understand. Which part? (laughs) Why does he think he deserves recognition? What's he saying here? Oh, yeah. He's just saying, like, respect my intelligence. And this is his way of pushing back. This is rebellious, natural. He knows he's smarter than these people instinctively. And so... He is pushing the line like he loves to do and he's going to do numerous times throughout the movie by saying, but wait, before, you know, after you give me punishment, just understand I also deserve some recognition here because I found holes in this thing quite easily that you didn't. So therefore, I am smarter than you. You get to punish me. Just know that I'm smarter than you. And I think that's what his way of pushing back on them without risking getting further punished is. It's a snide and smart way to do it. I I agree, John. I think he's just, I think, Zuckerberg is in the, in the film as depicted in this moment is saying, yeah, you have me here for this deposition. Everyone has their claims against me, but look what I did. Look what I did, you know, cut past all of this nonsense and bullshit the way that he sees it as nonsense and bullshit, because the other guys definitely have their legit claims on Zuckerberg, but he's like saying, you know what? Why don't you show me a little goddamn respect? Because of what I did. Look what I did. Look what I created. Look at what this thing is now. That's me. I did that. Regardless of what these guys are claiming, how I might have screwed them over, whatever, that's their claim. But I did this. So so kiss the ring and uh, kiss my ass at the same time. (laughs) (laughs) You know what I hadn't gotten, Scott, until you just said that, is the parallel between him being punished by the administration board in Harvard and him at the depositions. And that in both cases, I don't know if I describe Zuckerberg in this film as a sociopath. I think he has some of those tendencies. You know, but it's definitely, he's like, it doesn't matter that I broke the Harvard rules. It doesn't matter what, what how I treated Eduardo. Look what I did. You know, it's the accomplishment. And the thing about Facebook, Facebook today, not talking about Facebook when this film was made or when Zuckerberg created it. 
Facebook is fucking powerful yeah. for good, for evil, for all sorts of stuff. And it has been a power for both. And Zuckerberg created this thing that is 10,000 times more powerful, a million times more powerful than him, way beyond anything he could have conceived. Yeah. Get into the same thing. Look what I did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Again, it just, and it, it validates his intelligence because he's constantly trying to keep it in that position um, for, you know, however long it's been around, you know, it's about the power of this thing and people's mm-hmm. desire to use it in many, many ways. And whenever, when it was getting close to being like, they were starting to lose subscribers, people were starting not to go on Facebook. He hired all these people on the board and he put, you know, Sheryl Sandberg, lean in and all that stuff to try to change the narrative because he wants to stay in that position of power and he'll take the hits for it but he wants his ego stroked. And this is the thing that I also want to clarify. This moment is also important, Steve, because this is a mo- – don't get it confused if you see this movie as if Zuckerberg doesn't need his intelligence validated, just like the Winklevoss and everybody else. here. They all need to be stroked just in different ways. Mm-hmm. And Mark makes it obvious in this moment. Like he is going to constantly need recognition for what he's accomplished from everybody. And because in the way the film is constructed – He wants Erica to give him that recognition, which he never gets, but he takes substitute recognition at every moment that he can throughout the entire movie. This is one of those moments. It's really, it's, it's totally Zuckerberg versus everybody else. Yes. Yes. And, uh, and, and look, I mean, he's just like, say it like, it's like, look, look what I did and look what you guys are claiming. Like what, what's the, what's the end game here? Like what's the end result? The end result is, is I created Facebook and this is all me. I made this happen and we got more than a billion users at the time, you know, more than that now, probably, you know, Facebook is still very, very powerful. I remember when they were talking about making a movie about Facebook, I thought by the time this movie comes out, Facebook could be like MySpace, but that's not the case. Yeah. So he ends up, he gets six months uh, academic probation. He comes outside. He's talking to Eduardo. I love that Eduardo says, how do you do this thing where you manage to get all girls to hate us? (laughs) And then the next line, which I think is even more revealing, why do I let you? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. By the way, apparently Mark Zuckerberg was a pretty serious fencer, as in swords. Really? And so when Jesse Eisenberg, who studied Zuckerberg, studied every piece of video and film he could find... He took up fencing and that if you watch him move this a very art, upright posture that Eisenberg has in this film came from him studying fencing. And he says it actually really helped his uh, posture because he was a major sloucher. <laughs> um, so that was kind of good for him. We're at a programming class and uh, a woman in the class hands Mark a note that says, you dick. <laughs> and and I do like him walking out of the class and the professor saying, don't worry, worry, Mr. Zuckerberg, brighter men than you have tried and failed this class. And he turns without missing a beat and gives the entire answer he was asking on before exiting. And now here he meets the twins for the first time. So what can I do for you? Did I insult your girlfriends? No, you didn't. Actually, I don't know. Maybe never asked. Maybe we should do that. I think that is a key line yeah. of privilege. Yeah, it never occurred to them to check in with their girlfriends to see if they were upset. Right. Well, it's also sexist. Yeah, totally. Uh, and I also love the moment. You guys look like you spend some time at the gym. We have to. Why? We row crew. Which is a great callback to the Erica thing mm-hmm. that maybe she'd be interested in guys who row crew. Right. And then they take them to their final club where they can only let him into the bike room because he's not a member. How big an effect do you think that has on Mark's choices going forward? Big, huge. This is just sort of, I would say, pouring salt on the wound for Zuckerberg because he's already not cool enough to get into Saverin's group. And now here's another group of privileged guys who from the moment they say hello, the the, the feeling of the, the, the condescending attitude and the way they are talking down to him like you should feel lucky that we're even talking to you and 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 allowing you to help us out and zuckerberg is like you have no idea who the hell you are dealing with you have no idea and i think from the beginning 
like when Zuckerberg finally agrees to help them out and work with them, there is no no loyalty there, not for a moment, mm-hmm. even though I know how the story ended up, not for a moment did I feel like there was any kind of connection between between Zuckerberg and the twins where he actually liked these guys, not even a little. I totally agree. I think, and I think it's almost surprising in the end what he agrees. Okay, I'm in because yeah. you're like, what's what's going on here? One, one thing about the filming of it. So when they film it, again, it's this guy, Josh Pence and Army Hammer. And they shoot the scene the first time with Josh playing one of the parts, I don't remember which one, during which he makes the choice to sort of perch on this bicycle because they're in the bike room. And then Army has to then do everything Josh does. And when he goes to do it, he realizes it's really hard to stay balanced in the position that Josh was in. But he has to figure out how to do it because they already filmed it. And that's what Josh did, Um, which I just think is this totally bizarre acting thing. Wow. Mm. And what we hear basically is the idea he wants to sell them on is called Harvard Connection. And it's some kind of a social network. But what makes it unique is the harvard.edu email address that you need to log in. And they say the reason is Harvard EDU is the most prestigious email address in the country. The whole site's kind of based on the idea that girls, uh, not to put anything in delicate, girls want to get the guys who go to Harvard. Here, here's a question. I'm, I, I'm not expecting an answer here necessarily, but a question we're going to have to cons- consider throughout this discussion. Mm-hmm. Did this help Mark come up with the idea for Facebook? I think that's a question I can answer right away. <laughs> because when I was watching it, I absolutely felt like Zuckerberg is thinking, why are you being so, why are you limiting this? Like, you're not thinking of the big picture here, guys. I got that impression from the beginning that, that Zuckerberg is like, boy, you guys just don't get it, do you? Like, you guys, you you twins, you Winklevoss, Winklevi, whatever you want to call yourselves, are so narrow-minded in your scope of this. That is laughable. And Zuckerberg, I think, is looking down on the Winklevi more than the Winklevi are looking down on him. If you could have invented Facebook, you would have invented Facebook. It, it's that simple. And, and it's the, that simple. all great creators are influenced by the things they come in contact with. It's up to a legal thing to decide how much they are influenced by it. But Certainly it's there. I mean, you see some of the same beats and the same tropes in the same films or TV shows, and it's just the execution that separates them, right? And so, but with this in this situation, yeah, I thought he, I think he sees the Vinkovai for who they are, the fact that they're waiting for him. If they wanted, they wanted to meet him. He didn't want to meet them. They wanted to meet him. So it automatically puts him in a power position. And there's something Zuckerberg in the movie, right? I don't know about in real life, but in the movie, <laughs> Um, how, when you surrender power to Zuckerberg, he will take it and lord it over you and use it. And you immediately establish that relationship with him. When he cedes the power to Parker, you see the difference. And it's the only person, and Erica, I guess, that he cedes power to in the entire movie. And so you see the difference that he can do that when he wants to be. He can be this nice, affable, talking, talk, uh, uh, talkative guy when he actually respects you or what you've done. The fact that he only treats Parker and Erica because he has affection for her, uh, w- uh, you know, tries to be that way with them, it speaks to the way he uh, commandeers his life. And so the situation with Vinkova, he knows immediately um, uh, what's here. So he explores it. And once he realizes he can use some of it to advance what he's already started, then he takes it, you know, and plays them for fools the whole time because he knows he can because, as you said, Scott, he's more intelligent than they are. Yep. So I totally agree with what, what both of you have said. I think, first of all, Friendster and MySpace already exist. Yeah, yeah, you right. know, yeah. There's a dude at Exeter when Mark was in high school that made a social network at Exeter. It's not like these are new ideas. And there's so many times where I've been watching a thing or having a conversation and somebody else's idea gives me an idea. Right. And my idea, I would probably never have had that idea if it wasn't the, another person's idea. I was just on a cruise ship and they had a fucking ice skating rink in the cruise ship and we watched an ice show. And I started thinking as I was watching about, you know, one of these could be like, uh, wanted to be an Olympic skater. And then I went, 
oh, you know what would be amazing is to do the Rocky of ice skating where it starts on a cruise ship and that's where the person has to come back to to become an Olympic skater and it's their story. And I was like, and I said, so that's all I thought about. So would I have ever had that thought if I hadn't been in that place right. at that time? Never sure. would have had that thought. I don't intend on writing this particular film, but like, <laughs> but that's how creativity happens. What I think is that what I have to separate separate out is whether or not Mark, this helped Mark come up with the Facebook idea is one thing. His behavior towards the Winklevi after this is a completely different thing. Mm -hmm. Like that's a choice that he made that is so fucking stupid and, yeah. uh, you know, and petty. Uh, and we'll get into that as we go forward. <laughs> but the next thing that happens is we now we've, we've established these two, these two depositions. And now what we do is tell the story through intercutting between testimony at these two different depositions coming from multiple people and the real things that happen in terms of how he and Eduardo started this project that was going to be Facebook. When did you come to Eduardo? I don't understand that question. You remember answering in the affirmative. The affirmative? When did you come to Eduardo with the idea for Facebook? It was called the Facebook then. This doesn't need to be that difficult. I'm currently in the middle of two different lawsuits. And then we go to when he approached uh, Saverin about Facebook, and it was at the Jewish fraternity's Caribbean night party. <laughs> <laughs> And we cut to this party and, and the contrast between the final club party and this party is perfect. Eduardo is in a Hawaiian shirt and he does the funniest dance coming yeah. up to uh, Mark. And this is something that Andrew Garfield came up with on the set and Fincher saw him do it and went, this guy is going to be a movie star. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mark wants to tell him about his idea, but Eduardo says, I got punched by the Phoenix, which means one of these final clubs is interested in him. This is a key moment, I think. Absolutely it is, because Zuckerberg is like, oh, that's great, but he's jealous. Yep. Yeah. He's absolutely jealous. And also at this uh, this fraternity party, Saverin's having the time of his life. Yeah. And Zuckerberg is like, I just get me out of here. I mm -hmm. don't want to be here. And so they go outside, and this is where, as you mentioned, I think in our first part, they have uh, digital uh, <laughs> breath because it's cold. Yeah. What, Finch, yeah. what Fincher says was that it really was super cold that night, but the humidity wasn't right for people's breath to be visible. And he said he felt guilty that he put them through this shoot, and that was why he decided to do the CG breath. Oh. I don't know if that's true. Wow. But, but this is where Mark uh, lays out his idea. And it's connected to face mash because people want to see pictures of hot girls, but they could see pictures. Of, I like this logic, by the way. But it wasn't because they saw pictures of hot girls. You can go anywhere on the internet and see pictures of hot girls. Yeah. It was because they saw pictures of girls that they knew. People want to go on the internet and check out their friends, so why not build a website that offers that friends, pictures, profiles, whatever you can visit, browse around. Maybe it's someone you just met at a party. And that the lessons of hacking and stealing photos was something that they don't want to do. And that they want to take the things that they learned from the experiment and they can put it together to create this project. And by the way, this is the entire history of Facebook. You know what the slogan for the early years of Facebook was? I don't remember. What was it? M move fast and break stuff. I have no <laughs> idea. Yeah. Well, and into the first decade of Facebook was we're going to just put things out without fully testing it or thinking yeah. through it and see what people do with it. And if it's, and, and we're going to make mistakes and we're going to break things and then we're going to correct them. And that's why you see decades of privacy issues and you know, how they are manipulated. I mean, I can tell you some of the, cause having read this book of how they affected elections, how they affected genocide, how they, you know, because they, you know, when they moved into, is it Burma where, uh, Myanmar, I think, mm -hmm. which is where there was genocide caused by the social network. They didn't have anybody that spoke the languages there. So they didn't know what anybody was saying. So when people were saying these horrible, horrible things about this ethnic minority that ended up, you know, being committed genocide on Facebook, didn't know it was happening mm. because their policy was move fast and break stuff. They wanted to get there and get users first. That was, that's always been their philosophy. So I love, I love by the end, they have this totally bizarre uh, moment where he says, But I'm not talking about a dating site. I'm talking about taking the entire social experience of college and putting it online. And Eduardo says, I can't feel my legs. And he says, I know, I'm totally psyched about this too. <laughs> <laughs> and this idea of connecting the exclusivity of Facebook 
to the exclusivity of getting punched by the Phoenix Club for Eduardo, mm. I think is something very much created by Aaron Sorkin. You know, mm. but cinematically that 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 works. Oh, it totally, hundred percent works. Yeah. <laughs> See, in a world where social structure was everything, that was the thing. What's really interesting, by the way, is Eduardo's now de- being deposed in the Winklevoss case. Mm-hmm. So he's he's now a witness in one case while he's actually, you know, suing Mark Zuckerberg in the other case. It was a big project and he was going to have to write tens of thousands of lines of code. So I wondered why he was coming to me and not his roommates. And then cut to and this is how the depositions intercut seamlessly mm-hmm. with the reality, because we cut to Mark saying we're going to need a little startup cash to rent the servers and get it online. This is why he went to Eduardo, that it's going to be a 70 30 split with Mark getting 70 and him being 30. 30 for you for putting up the thousand dollars and for handling everything on the business end, your CFO. And you said? I said, let's do it. <sighs> Again, I knowing where the movie goes, yeah. you know, when you see this, you just go like, oh my gosh, like I just want to warn the guy. I just want to, <laughs> I just want to smack him in a in a in the nicest way possible and be like, wake up, dude. Look, yeah. you don't like like this guy's using you. You know, you better watch your back. Watch your back. I mean, you just see it coming. It's like it's like you do, and you can't look away. It's that kind of movie. So, uh, as you know, I'm trying to do research and find out what the actual facts are. And as I was looking at some stuff on Wikipedia, Wikipedia says they both put up a thousand dollars, not oh, that it was just Eduardo. So then I told you, you know, I read this book on Facebook. So then I went, fuck. And I went back and re-listened to the section of the book where they talk about this. And the fucking guy who wrote the book, as far as I could tell, does not say (laughs) anything about this first thousand dollars. And so I find it fish. You know, I think in general, Wikipedia is a relatively accurate thing. But I suddenly found that fishy of whether or not they both put up a thousand or if only Eduardo put up a thousand. It makes a huge difference in the per, my perception of this story. For sure, it does. For sure, in, in the real life version of the story, it exactly. absolutely makes a huge difference. But that's not what we're seeing in the film. Okay, did he add anything else? Yes. And we cut to Eduardo walking back inside of the party, and just before he goes in, Mark says, "It probably was a diversity thing, but so what." How fucking cruel is that? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of many cruel moments. Yeah. And, it's just, and I'm sure both of you had a friend who just did a little cut like that. Oh. You know, and you're just like, wait, what? 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 Yeah. Yeah. And a, a cut like that, many cuts like that, that you still just kind of move past and forgive and accept this just part of the conversation. That's just how this person is. But it's still like a warning. It's it's yeah. a it's a warning. Like, and you just you just can't conceive of what's coming. And even though you're watching, and when you're watching the film, and you know what's coming, it just you just go, oh my god, um, uh, you know, you're just geared, you you know it, and it, it's just like you just want to like scream, dude, smack, smack, smack him, and just go, oh my god, it's like painful. It's really painful. Yeah, but those, you know, those are the deals you make sometimes with people, and certainly in college, you, you know, you're gonna get into with friends and have those friends who are jealous of you, and you don't. Especially, it seems like because the way, you know, Andrew plays him, and the way Eduardo may have told his story, he is like, you know, the innocent victim in all of this, and in that moment, you see, like, you know, how could you ignore it? But when you're that young, you do because you're just kind of, oh, okay. And he seems to have a better personality than Mark. So he'd be more forgiving of that situation and Mark taking the shots and he probably feels pity for Mark or sympathy for Mark. So he kind of lets those slide when Mark makes those passive aggressive shots. Because I think later, right, is he, gonna, he says to him when he gets the letter, he's like, oh, well, just you've made it that far. This is good enough. Just the yep. fact you've made it that far. That's yet another shot about this kind of stuff. Because, you know, once again, it's about Mark being accepted, Mark being having the ego stroke to recognize for his intelligence or his value. It's a big deal to Mark in the movie, right? So him shooting down Eduardo, who he probably sees as um, more capable, more attractive, more, uh, uh, more social person. He adheres to the norms, social norms, and women find him probably more attractive than they do Mark. I'm sure they find him more attractive than they do Mark. Uh, in the construct, 
These are his ways of getting back at Eduardo for these things that Mark does not have. So he make, he takes these little shots. And Steve, you're 100% right. We've all had friends like this, and it's really unsettling when it happens. And you're just like, what do I do with this? You know? Yeah, yeah. But you know what, John? At the same time, mm. as the movie progresses, yeah, you see this gap growing between Saverin and Zuckerberg. Yes. Especially – when they meet uh, uh, Parker, Parker, Sean Parker. Yeah, yeah. Parker's because, the one who everything. Because, you know, because of the way we see Zuckerberg just like turn his attention, and, like latch on to Parker, sort of ride ride that wave and, and start to leave Saverin in the, in, in the dust. Yeah. And Saverin is, you know, he, is, he doesn't see where Facebook is going, where Zuckerberg does. So Zavarin is still going through the motions, like doing what you do when you're in college. You have an internship, and you know. And Zuckerberg is like acting like, like fuck all this college shit. Like yeah. this is where it is. This is where it's at. You know, we're gonna. Th- this is much much bigger than you, you. just can't see the forest through the trees to see how this big how big this is going to be. But as the gap between Zuckerberg and Zavarin continues to grow and grow, and then by the time Zavarin sort of like realizes. That he's mm-hmm. being left in the dust and he's trying to appeal. He's trying to appeal to Zuckerberg. Hey, yeah. wait a minute. Hang on a second. You know, what about me? What you're doing is not cool, but it's already yeah. too late. And, you know, as much as Saverin tries to appeal to him, Zuckerberg just won't listen. He just won't listen. Discovery is Sai, if you'll let me continue with my what line of suggesting? They're suggesting I was jealous of Eduardo for getting punched by the Phoenix and began a plan to screw him out of a company I hadn't even invented yet. And they ask him about this, and he says, I know you've done your homework, and so you know that money isn't a big part of my life, but at the moment, I could buy Mount Auburn Street, take the Phoenix Club, and turn it into my ping pong room. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a great, arrogant answer, but it doesn't answer the question that they're asking him of, were you jealous then? At that time, he couldn't buy Auburn Street and the Phoenix right. Club. Right. The question is, were you jealous then? And he has avoided that question. Yeah. Um, and what's the answer? Of course he was jealous. Based on yeah. what we see in the movie, 100%. Mm. Yeah. In the Winklevoss deposition, we're hearing Eduardo testify about what he knew uh, about Harvard Connection, which was very little. All he knew was that they had taken some meetings and that he didn't, he really didn't have much to do with the Winklevoss dating site. And here's an interesting thing. While this was happening, someone else had already built a social website for Harvard called the Harvard System. He had also invited Mark Zuckerberg to come work with him on it. And Zuckerberg had been on the the Harvard system was already launched and he had been on it and was looking at the code of the Harvard system, none of which he used in Facebook. But this other guy also later sued uh, Mark at this time. And then we hear a bunch of emails where Mark is stalling, essentially. From Mark Zuckerberg to Cameron Winklevoss, December 1st, 2003. Sorry I was unreachable tonight. I just got about three of your missed calls. I was working on a problem set for my systems class. And he is leading them on. And my question is, why is Mark doing this? Mm. That's a great question. Why is he? Okay. Okay. I think he's leading them on. And I never thought about this. I just sort of like went with the flow at this point in the movie. Yeah. I think he's leading He's leading the Winklevoss twins on so he can buy himself more time to launch Facebook. Oh, yeah. Good point. Yeah. So why not just not say... No. Why not just say, hey, guys, I can't do this. What? No. He because, wants to. Because he could have done that. But I think by leading them on, leading them on, the Winklevoss twins, they have their guard down about Zuckerberg. Mm. Like they're just not thinking it would never occur to them and it has not occurred to them, which is what puts them in this position that Zuckerberg would screw them over. You know, he's keeping his friends close and his enemies closer. (laughs) That's what he is doing here. That's what I think. I mean, I'm just like thinking about this for the first time because that's a great question, Steve. Um, But I think he's leading them on because he's he wants to buy more time, buy himself more time. But also, he's also not sure if he's ready to cut the Winklevoss guys loose yet because he might need them for something else, and he wants to hold them close to his vest until he realizes he really does not need them anymore. What do you think, Johnny? Yeah, I think Scott's right. I think he's, 
how can I say, it's like a relationship, right? Some people do this in relationships. They're not going to move on until they find someone else. Some people are built that way. Some people are built to break up with somebody when they're not feeling it and just end the relationship. And what you just said, Steve, works, right? You're like, why did you just break up with me if you didn't have feelings for me? Why did you wait until you met someone else and then broke up with me? So it's all a matter of what works for a particular person. And considering how Mark is such a user in many ways, uh, he was holding on to the Vinkovi for as much as he needed to until he was sure he was done scavenging the meat off that bone and was ready to move on to the next thing. And that's what he's doing here. So he keeps them on the on the leash, and he maybe even gets a sick kind of joy of how far he can push them, again, because they came to him. So he's in the dominant position. He can jerk them around. And as we find out later from the Winklevoss twins, they, or one of them, sees themselves as gentlemen of Harvard. So there are certain behaviors that you're allowed to participate in and other behaviors that you're not. And I think this is his way of thumbing his nose at the system, just like he thumbed his nose at the system when he, um, you know, when he broke the security there at the beginning of the movie. This is his way of thumbing his nose. It's rebellious. It's also, you know, terrible and poor form. But Zuckerberg doesn't care. I think throughout the course of this conversation that we've had now in uh, part two of eight of the <laughs> dive into the social network, I yeah. think John that describing. Zuckerberg as a user, I think that mm. is the first time that that word has been used to describe Zuckerberg uh, throughout the, the the course of this conversation up to this point. But yeah. that's what he is, and you're right. A lot of people who accomplish stuff sadly are users in this life. Yep. So, so I think I would divide it into two motivations, and and mm. both of which you've touched on. Um, one motivation is the totally mercenary. I want to stall them until I can get my thing out, you know, yeah. because then my thing will be more successful. Exactly. That one is super, that, that one is one you are going to get sued for, you know? So that's where it's like, you're creating a paper trail where people can find out that you actually were trying to fuck them. That is <laughs> one where you get sued for. Um, and in that light, I would like to read you a quote that is not in the film, but this mm -hmm. came from Mark Zuckerberg's AOL instant messenger log. Uh -huh. And it is, Someone else is trying to make a dating site, but they made a mistake. Ha ha. They asked me to make it for them. So I'm delaying it. It won't be ready until after the Facebook thing comes out. Yeah, I'm going to fuck them. Wow. Whoa. Wow. Oh, my God. <laughs> Seems pretty obvious. So that one's. <laughs> yeah. But and here's the other. Th and this is what I would say is the other motivation, I think. And I think this is true in that sentence. And it's true in the film, which is the moment they brought him into that bike room. He mm. wanted to say, fuck you to this privileged class. Oh, it probably. was a total, total like I want. I want to humiliate you guys. I want to fuck you guys. And, th and this is the thing, too. And I'm going to bring it back to Citizen Kane because class is a really interesting element in Kane because mm -hmm. Charlie Kane is born to the lower classes and then raised in the highfalutin upper classes. And in one of my favorite moments, and John, I know it's one of yours, and Scott, I'm sure you love this moment too, is when his banker who raised him, Thatcher, comes in to argue with him at the paper about how the paper is exposing the Traction Trust, fucking Orson Welles' monologue about that he is in fact two people. The trouble is you don't realize you're talking to two people. As Charles Foster Kane, who owns 82,364 shares of public transit, preferred, you see, I do have a general idea of my holdings. I sympathize with you. Charles Foster Kane is a scoundrel. His paper should be run out of town. A committee should be formed to boycott him. You may, if you can form such a committee, put me down for a contribution of $1,000. But then, and this is what's so amazing about the speech, is after acknowledging that he is part of the elite class, he says basically what he really wants to be is the enemy of the elite class. On the other hand, I am the publisher of the Inquirer. As such, it's my duty, and I'll let you in on a little secret. It's also my pleasure to see to it that decent, hardworking people in this community aren't robbed blind by a pack of money-mad pirates just because they haven't anybody to look after their interests. That split and the fuck you to the upper classes that raised Charlie Kane, that is totally what I think Zuckerberg feels about the fucking Winklevi. I never realized that connection, but boy, is that perfect. Yeah. And knowing as smart as, as Sorkin is, and especially because he was deliberately channeling Citizen Kane into his screenplay for The Social Network, 
that is a great way to another uh, of many ways to tie this film to that one. You, you know what it just makes me think of is the Winklevoss thinking their Harvard connection thing is what the origins of Facebook are is like criticizing Aaron Sorkin for being inspired by Citizen Kane in this film. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's Absolutely. like that, you know, one is they're totally different. It is the, it is the creative mind inspired by another creative mind. It's not stealing. And after some hazing, another envelope is slid under Eduardo's door who does this cool little, you could totally see the musical theater background for this actor as he does this little spin when he gets the, the card and that is Andrew Garfield's last shot in the film. Oh, wow. Okay. And then there's this moment, John, that you mentioned before of Mark needed more money for more servers. He mm. kind of asked Eduardo for him, except he already spent the money. Yep. And then Eduardo says, Hey, guess what? I made the second cut. That's good. You should be proud of that right there. Don't worry if you don't make it any further. <laughs> And Ow, you do see like, him register it, right? I mean, oh, yeah. Andrew Garfield is a drawer. He does register this, but then he's like, eh, okay. You know, he just moves on with it for now. There are more things of him canceling meetings, meetings with the Winklevoss. And as we see them, I just have to point out, there's a scene where they're eating burgers, the twins. So Fincher and the prop guy come up to Josh Pence, who has to eat, eat the first burger and say, mm-hmm. what kind of burger do you want? And Josh goes, oh, definitely be a double bacon cheeseburger for this guy. <laughs> And he's not thinking about, A, the fact that he's going to have to eat this, and B, he's going to have to eat it on a David Fincher movie who will do 100 takes. Yeah. And that if you look at the burger that they made him, it is the biggest bacon fucking cheeseburger <laughs> ever. And yes, he does have a spit bucket, but he has to eat this thing all day. But that's the the other thing he doesn't think about is whatever choice he makes, Army Hammer has to eat the same thing <laughs> because he has to do it next. So they ate a lot, a lot of burgers. <laughs> yikes mark is continuing to program by the way all these computer screens they're all blue screens so they can add it all later and they had a consultant going over every single bit of code that's typed into the computer not only to make sure that it's the kind of code that would have been used then but even like what version of the software that mark is using at that time so that everything is actually perfect even though it's scrolling by at a million miles an hour and nobody's seen it Yeah, because he knows people are going to slow it down. He knows people are going to slow it down and criticize it. Yeah, smart. Uh, I love the the (laughs) hazing scene where they have to uh, say the three lies about the statue of John Uh, Harvard they're standing in front of. One, Harvard was founded in 1636, not 1638. Two, Harvard was not founded by John Harvard. And three, that is not John Harvard. So good. It's now been 40 days since he agreed to help the Winklevoss twins. He's already registered the domain domain name of the Facebook. And... In the deposition, we see that Mark is doodling on a yellow legal pad. That's just something Jesse Eisenberg was doing. And Fincher commented on it. And he went, oh, I'm really sorry. And Fincher was like, no, that's perfect. Let's use that. And it became part of the movie. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I would be terrified to make a movie with David Fincher. Like, I would yeah. be like, <laughs> so <Really>? scared. <laughs> 99 takes. Like, no thanks. <laughs> Do you see any of your code on Facebook? I could Mark. Did I use any of your code? You stole our whole goddamn idea. Fellas. Match.com for Harvard, Can I continue guys. with my deposition? You know, you really don't need a forensics team to get to the bottom of this. If you guys were the inventors of Facebook, you'd have invented Facebook. That is the line of the movie. That that's, is the the movie that's the line of the movie. It is that, the, that is the line that just you just take that one line out and put it on a uh, movie poster. <laughs> and that sums up the entire film. If you guys would have yeah. if invented Facebook, you would have invented Facebook. I'm going to get uh, – this is something I feel very passionately about because I've been in this situation is that there's so many times where people think like the idea of a movie is in creating the movie. And it's like all of the fucking hard work that someone goes through all of – just like we're talking about in this film, thousands and thousands and thousands of little decisions and all this massive effort goes into making a good movie and some yeah. fucking executive or go, Oh, that was my idea. It's like, fuck you. If you were, if you wanted to, if you could have made that movie, you would have made the movie. Just having one fucking idea is there's a hundred thousand. Think of how many great ideas there are in this movie alone. Hmm. Like it's so, so the, if you were in the inventors of Facebook, you would have invented Facebook. I am 100% on Mark's side. In this. <laughs> For sure. Absolutely. I, you know, say what you want about, Zuckerberg is portrayed by Eisenberg in this film. 
Like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I can't wait to stand over your shoulder and watch you write us a check. No shit. Have either of you two been in a deposition or been deposed? No, never. Uh, I, I've been a witness at a trial. Okay. Um, but I have not been in a deposition, no. I was in two it. days of a deposition. Eight hours oh. both days. Oh, man. Um, for my father's uh, mesothelioma case. Mm. And I was a kid who uh, went with my father to go paint. And uh, General Pacific was the company. Mm. And they were... Uh, they were pushing back against the claims because my father was an independent contractor who didn't keep great notes. They were calling me as I was going to be called as a witness mm. right. to testify that we went to Maryland, that we got these products that we bought at the stores that I played on the canisters of the stuff that had asbestos in it and whatever. And so that gave my daughter, my dad, mesothelioma. So, so it is combative. And they yeah. ask you the same, and they, you know, dance around. And I had a lawyer with me. It was a hell of a thing, man. And there are moments where you really want to reach across that table, man, because oh, they'll start out with the whole like, oh, you know, we're friends here, and then they'll just get deeper and deeper into the stuff. And um, it is a hell of a battle when you're being deposed and still trying to stay firm on what you believe and what you remember, what you experienced. They what will have you question your name, you know, so. How old were you? Yeah, I was. I, this was only five years ago. So oh, the snippets. It was in the L.A. at the uh, near the Century City at one of those. Bi- yeah, the, one of the big uh, t- trade center, Power, World yeah. trade center buildings at Century City. It was way up there in one of those law offices, and it was a hell of an experience in a mm-hmm. conference room. And so I'm, when I'm watching this film uh, this time around, I'm like, God, man, this is all just like so perfectly done. The back and right. forth, the offense, the parsing out of what words should be said here, the combativeness of it all, it's all there ingrained in a deposition. So so, it, so it, what happened to you, Steve, or John, five years ago, re-watching the film, it must have impacted you on a completely different level. Yeah, this time around, because it's been a while since I've seen the film. So yeah, it did actually, watching it now, because mm-hmm. you're seeing like, I can see why both sides feel the way they do, or three sides, I guess, if you could include Eduardo, why they feel the way they do and why they're picking out certain things to try to make them seem like one thing or another or try to make them mean one thing or another or connect them to make it to an overall meaning or overall analysis of a situation. So, yeah, certainly, certainly. But it, you know, wow. Unbelievable. It, it's not something I ever want to experience again, but, you know, it's it's a hell of a thing that tests your patience, to be I honest. I bet it does. It's so funny. I had a very similar experience on the witness stand. It was much shorter. It wasn't two eight hour day sessions. And it wasn't it wasn't about my father and his death. So I can't imagine how difficult that must have been. Mark, there is a girl in your art history class. Her name is Stephanie Addis. Do you happen to know if she's a boyfriend? Have you ever seen her with anyone? And if not, do you happen to know if she's looking to go out Just with anyone? People don't walk around with a sign on them that says them. And I think this is one of the key moments where he 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 has another idea about Facebook, yeah. about what's motivating people. And he runs outside and does this very funny run in his shorts across the snow. This is Jesse Eisenberg's first day of shooting. Oh, wow. And Jesse uh, takes antidepressants. And he oh. also was taking some sort of garlic organic wellness capsule at the time and he's freaking out because he has a lot of anxiety before his very first shot of the film and he takes both of these things and he didn't have any water to take them and i guess they were the pills were kind of stuck in his throat and you know sometimes when you don't have water and the and i guess the garlic thing is like melting onto the antidepressant and fincher is going go run across the the snow and he starts running and immediately throws up mid shot Uh and and fincher runs out just totally concerned and right. jesse is just embarrassed and humiliated just like let's, just, let's not talk about it let's just keep going <laughs> more. Jeez. So that's a, that's a rough first day on the set yeah um plus, plus running in snow in your sandals so yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> um and then we cut to looking at the computer and there is the very first version of facebook this is what drives life in college are you having sex or aren't you it's why people take certain classes and sit where they sit and do what they do when at it some 
center, you know? That's what the Facebook is gonna be about. People are gonna log on because after all the cake and watermelon, there's a chance they're actually gonna, gonna get laid. Meet a girl. Yes. And it's ready. And on the masthead, it says Eduardo Saverin co-founder. And this is a moment where maybe I do see connection to them as friends. You have no idea what that's going to mean to my father. Sure I do. That feels like a friendship moment to me. Sure, it does. There are moments for sure. And I think that's essential, Steve, because otherwise, if you don't feel any connection of any friendship at all at any time in the film, it's not going to have the impact that, that ultimately the film will not have the impact that it does. Right. Yeah. And right from what I feel was a moment of real connection, <laughs> the Mark then asks for the emails of everybody at the Phoenix, the final mm-hmm. club that Eduardo's trying to get in. Yeah. He, he, the user, st- the user impulse is still there. And yeah. right after he gives him that little thing about his dad, he says, you got to give me all your emails. Come on, man. They're, these guys are just going to share it amongst themselves in this small quarter. You got to break the rules and give me those emails. Yeah. Well, and the thing is that is fucking Facebook. Facebook, throughout its entire history, has found ways to get your information, share your information, yeah. use your information to bring in other users. There are so many, so many scandals right. of how they were taking and using people's information against their wishes or invading their privacy. That is the history of Facebook. Yeah. And it starts right here in this moment. Yeah, the site um, is live. It's like, like this is it. This is the uh, the ground zero moment for Facebook. You know, you think yep. of how big Facebook is. Let me ask you a question, uh, John. Start with you. Like, what was the first moment that you connected on Facebook? Do you remember when you went, "Oh, what's this?" and like said, "Oh, this looks interesting. I'm going to create a profile." Do you remember that moment? I do. I was an avid Friendster person and a MySpace person, so I enjoyed. I've always been a fan of technology and connecting with people. Um, you know, even now I'm debating buying the blue check mark on Twitter and whatever. But like, I I appreciate connection. I'm not one of these people that wants to unplug and go into the woods for five days. Fuck that. I don't like I any do. of that. <laughs> yeah, I know some people are built, and I totally respect that. I'm just not. I I don't want to. I don't want to be away from my phone. If I could implant it into my body, I would. So the idea of a something else. I'd heard about this from a couple of my friends who were in college. So when it was like, as we see in the movie, when it's starting to pop on, because it wasn't like live that everybody could join it. It was for colleges only initially. And so that's how it kind of rolled out. And I remember hearing from a couple of my friends about it. And I tried to sign up, but I couldn't because I didn't have an email that was at, at that college. So I had to wait until he actually made it live for everybody before I could get on it. But once I did, I obviously had friends who were uh, available to this. So like we all got on and we all created profiles and we all friended each other yeah. once it was open. But I do remember like trying to create a profile and then them saying, you can't do it because you have to have a college email address oh. that is within the system of Facebook initially. So what year was that? What year was that, John? Oh, I don't remember. When did it go live? When did it officially uh, go live? I, I don't remember well, I guess it, 2004 is when it went yeah, live. So, yeah, so yeah, probably right around there in LA, probably yeah. in LA at UCLA or maybe USC. Some friends of mine were on it, and I couldn't join it because I didn't have address to those colleges. What about you, Steve? I'm literally trying to figure that out right now. I was looking <laughs> on, online to go like, there's there's got to be a method to look up, and and I just don't have time to figure it out at the moment. Right. But there is a method to look up well, what your earliest post was. But it was pretty early, and I'm sure, John, because we were in the same group of friends, that yes. all of us probably got on there around the same time. Yeah, probably. And it was, yeah, I don't know, 2008, something like mm-hmm. that, it would be my guess. Um, but I, and, and what I remember, I had done MySpace, I had done Friendster. Yeah. I remember when Facebook happened that I was like, this is really cool. And the thing that I thought was coolest about it was that there were these friends of mine, like from college or high school, that I genuinely, genuinely liked and totally yeah. lost touch one from. And then and then seeing like, oh, my friend, you know, April has two kids. And mm. oh, this friend did this. And like seeing these people that I really, really liked, I was like, this is really, really cool. That mm. was my early experience with Facebook. My later experiences with Facebook <laughs> got less and less cool. And at this point, I mean, I kind of look at it every couple of days. Right. And 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 honestly, if I didn't have shows with the two of you, I would probably do a lot less social media than I do because mostly I find it pretty destructive. I I, I agree with you, Steve. If it wasn't uh, 
Well, uh, my my entry, as you know, Johnny and Steve, yeah. I, I have affinity for release dates. <laughs> yeah. So I remember it was my first time at the Toronto Film Festival in 2007, and I was waiting on the press line to to cover the premiere of Michael Clayton, the George Clooney movie. Yeah, yeah. And I get this email from one of my colleagues at Access Hollywood who was at the LA office. Her name is Jay. And she like sent me an email about, uh, you know, hey, how's it going? And it wasn't the NBC email. It was this other email. And I started going back and forth on the email. I'm like, what is this? She goes, oh, it's Facebook. You should, you should you know, build a profile. So while I was standing there on the press line, because, you know, you're waiting forever on those things, I yeah. sat there on my BlackBerry and wow. created my very first Facebook profile. Wow. So and remember. My very first post was something along the lines like, I just saw Michael Clayton with George Clooney. This movie's amazing. George Clooney uh, has never been better and so on. Um, and my, my connection to Facebook you know, over the years has changed, or at least my, uh, my use of it. Uh, I'm, I'm more towards your approach with it, Steve, especially in the last uh, six years. I, I went through a lot of, a lot of change in my life personal and professional life to the point where I felt like I'm just going to use Facebook to promote the work I'm doing. Mm. So if I'm doing an episode of the cinephiles, if I'm doing an episode of enterprise incidents, or if I, you know, uh, you know, have a, you know, a, a KTLA thing that I was on, I'll post it on Facebook, but mm -hmm. all my personal stuff, I will not do. I, I keep my personal life and my private life and, uh, my, my professional life completely separate. And, you know, other than like, you know, posting about the Beatles, I, I do <laughs> not, and, and Star Trek, obviously, I keep Facebook very much. It's just uh, a promotional tool for work. Mm. Anyway. <laughs> okay, this next scene is just a funny story to me, which is that the next scene is we're going to be seeing this acapella group performing, which, by the way, the acapella group is supposed to be the Harvard Crocodillos. And mm -hmm. it's so funny because... As I said, Fincher and Aaron Sorkin went over every line, everything in the script. Fincher is really meticulous, except for it seems like he didn't go over this with Aaron Sorkin because he reads the scene and he goes, oh, this is hilarious. You know, this, who nobody nobody cares about acapella groups. I'm going to stage it in this empty hall where people are paying no attention to this whatsoever. And that's the joke of the scene. And Aaron Sorkin, who, by the way, has a degree in musical theater and is a huge musical guy, knows that the Harvard Crocodillos are actually a huge deal and sell to <laughs> packed houses. And so he was super excited to see how Fincher would portray this amazing vocal group. And he shows up on the set and sees this empty set. And he's like, what are you doing? And Fincher's like, well, isn't this supposed to be a joke? And he's like, no, this is the Harvard Crocodillos. <laughs> Um, that is but none of which is terribly important. They're singing in the background. It's not the Harvard Crocodillos, by the way. And what's really important is that Davia is looking at his computer and has seen this Facebook thing happen. It's great, too, because he's looking at his girlfriend's computer. Yes. When he, see, yeah. when he sees like he just really basically sees like he's been screwed over, you know, he grabs her computer, you know, <laughs> right. slams the laptop shut, grabs it, starts running out and goes, oh, wait, this is yours. You know, he runs back. You know, it's such a moment of just panic. Apparently, this actor is a was a serious smoker mm -hmm. and Fincher made him run across this bridge many, many times. And he, true too threw up. In the oh, process of shooting this. <laughs> do you mean do you mean Max Minghella, the actor who plays the yeah. The friend? Yeah. You know what's great about Max? Max is Anthony Minghella's son, the director yeah. of English Station. I was yeah. wondering that. that yeah, yeah, yeah. Me. So he's such a good actor. He's a British actor. Yeah. Such a good actor. And That's I great. love him in this movie. He's the perfect energy as kind of the conduit between the Vinkelvi yeah. and um Zuckerberg. And you sense that he's not a guy who was necessarily born into wealth. Old right. money, as you sense from the Winklevoss. So you, Winklevoss, rather, so you see that he's kind of in between them in terms of status. So it makes it a very interesting character to have here running throughout. And yes, him freaking out and knocking over the chairs. And it's all right, it's all right, it's all right. It's all right and running out and it, it's hilarious. So he shows up at the rowing gym, and which is, by the way, shot at BU, and basically says they stole their website. And then we go to a scene with one of the twins on a call with their dad's lawyer. And I think that it's, 
Cameron, who is generally the calmer twin, and Tyler, who is the more aggressive twin. But being that they are twins, and they're both <laughs> Army Hammer, I really can't keep track of it exactly. But I love as they're kind of going through what's happened and explaining the situation, that at one point, uh, the twin on the phone, which I think is Cameron. I'm sure you're right. He's, he's a good guy, and he's very bright, and I'm sure he didn't mean to do wow. what he did. And the reaction from Davia and Tyler to this is just like, this is a good guy. We don't know that he's not a good guy. We know he stole our idea. We know he lied to our faces for a month and a half. No, he never lied to our faces. Okay, he never saw our faces. Fine, he lied to our email accounts and he gave himself a 42 day head start because he knows what apparently you don't, which is that getting there first is everything. I'm a competitive racer, Div. I don't think you need to school me on the importance of getting there first. Thank you. All right. And this is the dynamic we're gonna see is that Cameron wants to have this sort of, we're all good Harvard men, as you mentioned before, John. Mm. And Davia and, and Tyler are pretty much ready to go to war. And we get to this moment where he says, What, do you want to hire an IP lawyer and sue him? No, I want to hire the Sopranos to beat the shit out of him with a hammer. We don't even have to do that. That's right. We can do that ourselves. I'm 6'5", 220, and there's two of me. <laughs> what a line. What a line. And Harvey crushes it. Yeah. And the like, I mean, Sorkin just you just go, okay, God, this guy is a brilliant writer, he's a genius. It's such yeah. a great line, yeah. It's it's a really funny line, by the way. One of them is wearing like this old beat up sweatshirt, it was a sweatshirt that a, a teamster on the crew was wearing. And Fincher loved the sweatshirt and basically pulled out some money and bought the sweatshirt off of him and handed it to Army Hammer to wear <laughs> without even washing it. And it was a bit stinky, but that is what he's got on in the scene. What is that on the bottom of the page? It's a Mark Zuckerberg production. Uh, on the home page? On every page. <laughs> Shit, I need a second to let the classiness wash over me. Wash over me. <laughs> but the reason that Cameron doesn't want to go after him is he says because... Because we're gentlemen of Harvard. This is Harvard where you don't plant stories and you don't sue people. And I'm like... It's one of the top law schools in the country. You're saying that people from Harvard don't sue people? <laughs> like, it, come on. All they do is sue people. <laughs> um, and we're back at the deposition, and we get into a conversation of whether or not Mark knew that they came from money and why he didn't go to them for the money rather than going to, the, to Eduardo. I went to my friend for the money because that's who I wanted to be partners with. Eduardo was the president of the Harvard Investors Association, and he was also my best friend. And they cut to a shot of the empty chair and he says, your best friend is suing you for $600 million. I didn't know that. Tell me more. Oh, I love that actor who plays the lawyer. He's so good. He's like, your best friend is suing you for $600 million. And then what we hear is everybody on campus starts using this thing. And Mark was the biggest thing on a campus. It included 19 Nobel laureates, 15 Pulitzer Prize winners, two future Olympians, and a movie star. Oh, who's the movie star? <laughs> Doesn't matter. <laughs> And gentlemen, do you know who the movie star is? No. Natalie Portman. Natalie oh. Portman, yeah. Yeah. Wow. She was at Natalie she was at, Portman, my friend. Because she was at Harvard, right? Yeah, is that right? That's right. Oh, wow. Yeah. We are at a lecture. They got the premier Bill Gates impersonator in the world to play Bill Gates, <laughs> which is like seems to be a dubious title, but I guess must come up. And and people when they're having screenies would come up to Fincher and they go, Man, how did you get Bill Gates to do this movie? And Fincher's response was. Well, when you got a good script. <laughs> <laughs> he brought that magazine up and he showed it to me and he said, look, it's going to happen with Alice. And I said, okay, let's get basic hardware. Now, most of you think you know the rest of the story, but you may not. Do you guys know what story Bill Gates is referring to here? No. 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 Uh, is it the story with the, about uh, Steve Jobs? No. So there's, there's two possible stories, and I'm, I'll tell them both quickly, but they're both great, and I bo they both have a lot to do with Mark Zuckerberg. The first is is the very first kind of personal computer is a computer called the Altair, which was being made in New Mexico. And basically, Bill is like a sophomore at Harvard, and they decide to drop out of school and move to New Mexico to write BASIC, which is the programming language for the Altair, mm. in order to create Microsoft. So that's the first story. But the second story I think that I think is just really important to Mark Zuckerberg, as with Bill Gates as a hero, is do you know of the story of how they sold uh, DOS, which is the operating system for PCs, to IBM? No. So Apple has come out with the Apple II and is selling personal computers. And IBM, the big, huge, powerful, giant company, 
they're like, people don't need computers. We're building computers for business. And now they go, I guess we should build personal computers. But they didn't have an operating system. And nobody gives a shit about operating systems. What's important is hardware. So they're going, look, we should just buy an operating system. So Bill Gates and Microsoft goes to pitch. They're nobody. They're totally nobodies. And they go to pitch IBM. And they say, we have an operating system. We can deliver it to you in like three weeks. The thing is, they don't have an operating system. And they make a deal with IBM. And they say, basically, look, we're going to sell you this operating system for really, really cheap. We only want two things. We want a percentage of every computer you sell it this operating system on and we'd like the right to we keep the rights to our own operating system so we we if we wanted to sell it to another computer we could do that too and ibm goes who cares nobody cares about software it's just about hardware it's totally fine so they sell an operating system that they don't own then they fly to seattle because they know a guy in seattle i think who has an operating system they say listen we'll buy your operating system off you for fifty thousand dollars and the guy goes yeah, it sounds great because nobody's talking that kind of money. They sell the operating system for $50,000. They sell that to IBM. IBM buys that. And of course, it becomes huge. But what really becomes huge is clones because it's not about IBM. It's about Compaq. It's about HP. It's about all the other companies, mm -hmm. all of whom have to use DOS operating system, which is the one they bought, which is how Microsoft totally eclipses IBM in the long run and becomes at the time the biggest computer company in the world. Wow. And it's all through just, a, I won't say it's a shady business move, but it is a aggressive. And you think about Mark Zuckerberg and what's going to happen with him and Eduardo. And you think about moves that Facebook made. I think this is an inspiring story for Mark. Amazing. And the other thing that happens in this meeting is that very attractive woman leans over to Eduardo and says, so I made deals with you. Is that Mark Zuckerberg? They can save me one yeah. day. You made the Facebook. I am 20 yeah. This is Brenda Song, who Fincher absolutely loved from the moment she auditioned. She auditioned using sides from the West Wing because this was the untitled Aaron Sorkin project and they wouldn't let anybody see the script. So she wow. basically was reading West Wing sides when she got the part. Apparently, when she's off camera and it's Andrew Garfield's shot, she was just whispering horrible, filthy things to him to get reactions at his reaction shot, which I think is great. And we can all go for a drink later, which is stunningly great for two reasons. One, she said Facebook, right? And then the other is, I want to have drinks later. Yes. Have you ever heard so many different good things back into one regular size sentence? <laughs> which is, I think, really funny. And I love that this guy comes up and goes to Mark Zuckerberg and says, I could swear he was looking at you when he said the next Bill Gates could be right in this room. I, I doubt it. And I showed up late. I don't even know who the speaker was. <laughs> Bill Gates. So uh, at this moment where suddenly Mark Zuckerberg, who had been humiliated at Harvard before, had been broken up with by the girl that he likes, had felt really demeaned in the bike room at the Phoenix Club by the Winklevi, is suddenly being talked about as the next Bill Gates. I think that's a good, as good a time as any to end part two of our exploration of the social network. As always, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Yes, we're going really slow, but this is a really, really big topic. You could visit us on our Facebook page. Just do a search for The Cinephiles. It's Cine underscore files on Twitter, The Cinephiles podcast on Instagram. You could subscribe to the show at all the usual places and please leave your reviews. Let us know if you like us breaking this down into as many parts as we might be doing. Okay. We'd love to hear those comments on YouTube if you subscribe to the show there. You can buy The Social Network along with every other film we've ever reviewed on cinephiles.net and you could support the show at patreon.com slash the cinephiles john how would people yes. find you you can always find me at the roca says on twitter instagram and tiktok the outlaw nation on twitch uh my youtube channel youtube.com slash john roca says and uh, my other podcasts the geek buddies and the hot mic and scott are there any other projects or podcasts that you'd like to take a moment to plug on the cinephile wow. Well, Steve, I mean, of course, everyone listening to this podcast, to this this deep dive, this ultimate deep dive of the social network, which I've been waiting years to do with you guys. I'm sure you are all massive fans of Star Trek. <laughs> you know, so for those of you who actually are fans of Star Trek, especially old school Star Trek, you can catch me doing the Enterprise Incidents podcast with Scott and Steve, that is Steve Morris, and we are doing uh, our deep dive now of the animated series of Star Trek, but we have covered all 80 episodes of the original series, and if you 
like Star Trek, if you love Star Trek, these are essential listens. So you can catch Enterprise Incidents with Scott and Steve on all the podcast platforms, of course, on Apple Podcasts and on YouTube. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Movie Mance. And make sure you share this episode of The Cinephiles on your social media platforms, especially Facebook. <laughs> so for people can discover the cinephiles maybe there are people who aren't listening to the cinephiles yet but this is the episode to do so and then you've got the motherload of episodes of the cinephiles and make sure you head to apple podcasts and leave your review of the cinephiles because that is where where steve and john love to get the reviews and the feedback and uh you know i'm just really enjoying this deep dive of the social network you know what? Nowhere, no, we've never had any guest that plugs the cinephiles yeah. better than Scott Mann. So thank you for that. <laughs> and I will say that just a couple of days ago, we had the ultimate crossover between not just the cinephiles and Enterprise Incidents, but the cinephiles and Enterprise Incidents and the Geek Buddies. Geek buddies. As we did a spoiler review of the incredible finale of season three of The Card. That was an absolutely fantastic conversation. And yes, so after fun. you subscribe to the Cinephiles and Enterprise Incidents, head over to the Geek Buddies because you should not miss that conversation. That's Yeah, that's on the Outlaw Nation YouTube channel. And the Geek Buddies have their own separate podcast feed that you can listen to that uh, if you don't want to watch our pretty faces talk about it for sure. Although you should want to watch our pretty faces. <laughs> God, as always, it's an absolute pleasure having you on the show. And I think that's it for this week. And we'll see you next time for another part of our continuing exploration of David Fincher's The Social Network.